And there you can see our website, our email address, and all of our social media so that you can stay in touch. And today we are joined by, as soon as my computer wants to move to the next slide. Um, today we are going to discuss sea turtle conservation and I am thrilled to be joined by Kat DiStefano. Um, she is a hugely important member of the DCP family, even if she's if she's moved away a little bit. Um, she is a citizen scientist extraordinaire and she um, began I would say with her love of the ocean, probably in the womb, um, growing up near the sea and whatnot. But as an undergrad, she got into scuba diving, uh, did a semester with SEA, um, learning oceanography and sailing and all of cool stuff with them. And then she was an intern with DCP um, way back when, when DCP, uh, two states ago, three states ago, when DCP was in California. Um, so Kat has been a part of our Bimini research family. And then the scuba diving world stole her away from us, um, but she never forgot how much she loves learning about animals and helping animals. Um, so while many of our webinars are led by PhD, smarter pants scientists, um, we can learn a lot from people who dedicate um, their hobbies to uh, the environment and the sea. Um, so a reminder to use that chat function for your questions and we will save our questions for the end, but you can feel free to enter them into the chat all along the way and we'll keep track of them. And so with that, I am going to pass the screen over to you, Kat. Thank you. Let me get myself set up here. Can you see my screen okay? We can. Thank you. All right. Um, cool. Okay. Thank you so much for that awesome introduction, Kel. I appreciate it. Um, and thank you to DCP for having me as a guest speaker on the webinar series. I am honored to uh, have been selected for um, as Kel said, I'm not a professional biologist or academic. Um, I have a love for the ocean. Um, I do a degree in animal behavior and psychology um, and have spent 15 plus years um, in, in the water, around the water, around really smart people around the water. Um, and so I ask a lot of questions and I like to educate myself. Um, but I have spent the past 10 years um, working with um, the New England Aquarium as a volunteer and seasonal staff member in their rescue and rehab department uh, with uh, stranded sea turtles. Um, so I've gained a lot of knowledge that way, um, as well as scuba diving with them um, and watching them um, and learning about them as we swim together. So uh, things that you might learn in this presentation, um, we'll talk about what exactly a sea turtle is, kind of back to basics, a little bit about the anatomy and individual species information, um, I'll talk about their nesting, life cycle, and migration, as well as threats, and then a couple of conservation stories specific to the Kemp's Ridley sea turtle, which is the one that I do most of my um, work with, um, although I spend a lot of time with the other species as well. So um, first thing to know is that there are actually five different families taxonomically of turtles. And a lot of questions um, people ask are about tortoises versus turtles. What are the differences? Um, so a little bit about that. Uh, tortoises are one of the five families of uh, turtles. Uh, they are the only ones that are primarily land-based um, and those are called tortoises. Um, so not all tortoises, not all turtles are tortoises, but all tortoises are considered turtles. They have big heavy shells that are dome shaped, which makes them really hard to be predated on. Um, and that's why a lot of times you hear that turtles are really slow animals. That's these land turtles. These are the ones that are super slow, but they're also very indestructible. Um, they do live a really long time. Um, the oldest one to, that's still alive today is named Jonathan in the Seychelles, and he's 187 years old, meaning he was born around 1832, which that's a very long time ago. Um, and the oldest one that we know of is um, one called Idwata that was born in India um, to live to an old age of 250 years old, um, died in 2006. 
Moving on to the aquatic turtles, um, they don't live quite as long, but they do. Um, they are pretty long lived. Um, the four other families of turtles um, are the soft shell, the snapping turtle. Those are the two kind of freshwater aquatic turtles. And then the sea turtles, there are two families of those, which we'll talk about very shortly. Um, these aquatic turtles are uh, very streamlined um, and they are very fast. So these turtles definitely don't fall into the whole tortoise and the hare uh, fable of being slow. They are extremely fast in the water. Um, they have webs, webs between their, um, their fingers um, and their claws, or they have these big flat paddle-like arms that they can propel themselves through the water with. Um, so very, very quick animals. Um, they are both herbivores and carnivores. Uh, most turtles are both, most of the aquatic turtles are both versus the land tortoises um, primarily are herbivorous. Some anatomy, because I'll be talking about different parts of the turtle throughout, so we'll kind of cover that pretty quickly. Um, the top of the shell is called the carapace, and it is attached to the bottom of the shell, which is called a plastron. Um, and in between the, I'll turn on my laser pointer here, um, in between the, uh, on the shells, you can see on the carapace, um, there are these little lines that separate these plates, um, and these plates are called scoots. Um, they are actually bone underneath and then a keratin-like coating on the top to protect them. Um, so the top part of the shell is very, very hard and very bony. Um, and then the underside is a little bit more flexible. Um, it's mostly made of uh, some ribs and keratin and bone. Um, and it is um, it also has those scoots that you can see, little seams between the plates. Those are also the growth plates for the turtle. So if you um, notice the there's a little bit of a whiter coloration between the scoots and that is where the plates are separating so that the turtle can grow. The shell stays with them their entire lives. Um, unlike in cartoons, the turtles don't go find another shell. They cannot ever leave that shell and sea turtles cannot hide their cells inside the shell either. Their heads and their fins or flippers do not fit inside that shell so they can't tuck in uh, like most land tortoises can. Uh, their flippers are big and flat, as you can see here, that keeps them propelling through the water uh, very quickly. Their back flippers act like rudders to help them steer. Um, and they have claws on both their rear and their front flippers as well um, for gripping um, onto parts of the reef. Um, not really too much protection there, um, but it's mostly for grip. Um, you can tell a male from a female sea turtle um, when they get older. So on this turtle, uh, it's a little too small. Uh, it's usually, I'd say, 10 to 12 years or older. Um, you can start to tell males from females. Their tail is kind of where they hold their, their sex organs. They have cloacas, um, like birds do, with one orifice for everything. Um, and if the tail extends out beyond the shell more than a couple of inches, then that's a male sea turtle. Um, and if it's only like an inch or two and it's a bit wider than that is a female sea turtle once they're um, usually over I would say three feet two to three feet depending on the species um, in size. Sea turtles as a species are super old animals um, they've been found um, there's fossils that are found most recently 145 million years old um, meaning that they existed during the times of the dinosaurs um, and since that long ago, when you look at the fossils versus the turtles of today, not much has changed evolutionarily. A lot of the anatomy is exactly the same. So these turtles are basically, as you, you see them now, is how they have always been. Um, there are lots and lots of extinct species of sea turtles. Um, nobody really knows quite for sure how many there are, um, maybe somewhere in the vicinity of 12 to 13. Um, one of the ones they know of uh, was over 12 feet long, um, and it was called uh, it's called an Archelon, um, and there is a kind of comparison picture for you, uh, so you can see how big the sea turtle would have been compared to this little scuba diver person here. Um, it's quite large. Um, if you're ever at the Georgia Sea Turtle Center um, on Duggal Island, they do have, um, I believe it's a uh, jaw of, um, of them on display, and it's quite impressive to, to see the size of these turtles. Um, there's only seven species uh, that exist today. I'm going to talk mostly about five of them, um, but this is a great graphic. It kind of shows you the size differences between them as well as the coloration. Um, a lot of times people have a hard time telling species apart um, because uh, it's the scientific papers say, oh, count the scoots, like count how many of these scoots there are. 
um, on each turtle, but I find it much easier to identify them based on their color and their size. Um, and if, it's, if there's any question, then you can fall back on the scoot counts as well. But this back, background shadow here shows you the Archelon, which is extinct. Um, but then the next largest one is the leatherback sea turtle. Um, and that is the only one that exists in its family. I told you there were five families of turtles and there are two families of sea turtles. This is one of the families here is the uh, leatherback, um, the Dermocles. Um, and then the other six species um, are hard-shelled sea turtles. Um, and that is in order of size, the green sea turtle, the loggerhead, the flatback, the hawksbill, the olive ridley, and the kemp's ridley. I'm not gonna talk much about the olive ridley and the flatback because I don't have a lot of experience about them and they aren't really found over in this part of the world um, in, the, in the Western hemisphere. Um, I'll talk primarily about the leatherback, loggerhead, green hawksbill, but then mostly about the Kemp's ridley because that's the one I have the most experience with. So the leatherback um, is the only surviving member of its species um, and it is the largest. It, is up to 10 feet long, a uh, thousand pounds or so, and they are very, very strong. I've been fortunate enough to be able to interact with, I think three living uh, leatherbacks, um, one of which completely knocked me over as we were trying to, it was, it was stranded up in a marsh in Cape Cod, and we were just, we we're trying to rescue it. Um, we were trying to rescue an 11 foot animal. Um, there are 10 people surrounding it, basically just trying to turn it in the right direction and kind of push it because there's not much else you can do for an animal that size it's in a marsh where a boat nor a truck can be. So um, it definitely knocked us over with her very large flippers. Um, they don't have a hard shell. This shell that you see here on the back is just, uh, it's kind of stretched out skin over ribs um, and then a layer of blubber and skin. Um, they are very, very fast. So you can see on the top of the shell, there are these ridges that are kind of like keels, um, the same way that a boat has a keel, um, because she can move so fast, um, needs to kind of keep that stability in the water. They primarily feed on jellyfish and they are pelagic. These are not kind of turtles that you're gonna see on a, a reef at all. Um, they are going to be found out in the open ocean. Um, they're gonna follow the jellyfish and uh, other things that they are gonna eat on. Um, they're found all over the world. They have the widest distribution of any sea turtle. Um, and compared to other sea turtles, they do grow fairly quickly. Um, they grow to reproductive age at about 13 to 15 years. We don't know what their lifespan is at all because these guys do not survive at all in any sort of captive uh, or rehab program. We've had two, three now that have come into our facility, um, only one of which went back out again. They just, once they're up on the beach and stranded, they're, they're, they're not in good shape at all. Um, so they, uh, we don't know much about them. We do some tagging data on them uh, now with the funding that the aquarium gets, but still they live so long that we really don't quite yet know how long their lifespan is. Um, this terrifying picture is actually part of the anatomy of uh, le leatherback and other sea turtles. Um, as you saw in the previous photo, they um, feed primarily on jellyfish, which are very slippery. Um, and so that is part of their esophagus. Um, inside of a few different species of turtles, you will see these, um, they're kind of, they're, they are spikes. Um, they're made out of a keratin type of material. They're not super sharp, but they definitely are pokey. Um, and what happens is they'll ingest the jellyfish or whatever thing they're feeding on. And their esophagus acts almost like a vice. It'll squeeze that, um, they don't have teeth, so they can't macerate anything. So they'll squeeze that food um, through their esophagus. The spikes will keep it in place and then um, the seawater will be expelled so they don't ingest a ton of seawater because it's not you know, easily um, available for them or easy for them to drink. They need fresh water as well, which they get from their food. Um, so the spike's gonna keep that slimy jellyfish in place from going back out of its mouth and then they'll continue to ingest. And the other four species of sea turtle I will talk about are part of the hard-shelled sea turtle family. Um, and these are bony, they're, they're uh, carapaces are bony, covered with keratin, uh, very hard shelled. Um, and that is the, we'll talk first about the logger, nope, the greens, and then the loggerheads, then the hawksbills and the kemp's ridges. So the green turtles are um, the next largest speed turtle. Um, they are 
pretty easy to tell apart if you look at their head compared to any other sea turtle species. Their heads are fairly small in comparison to their body, and they don't have any sort of a, a sharp beak like the loggerhead or particularly the hawksbill hat. The front of their face is very smooth and rounded. Um, their shell has this absolutely beautiful pattern on them, um, which means that unfortunately they were uh, have been historically hunted for um, that beautiful um, shell pattern of jewelry. Um, they do get up to about 500 pounds um, unless they're in captivity. We have one at the aquarium that is Last I checked, 560 pounds, um, but it's perfectly healthy. <laughs> and uh, they get up to four, four and a half feet. Mostly found in temperate, temperate and tropical waters. They do migrate up to um, New England area, up to the southern parts of Alaska, um, into colder waters um, for the summertime when they uh, need to bulk up and feed. Next in line is the loggerhead, um, probably the most commonly seen, especially around Florida. Um, they have really, really big heads, which is where they get their name from. Um, and they're probably easier to distinguish from other sea turtles just based on their color. Um, I find it's easier to see that they're a very like brownish red color with a cream colored um, skin underneath. Um, and that, that head is definitely distinct. It kind of looks like a, like a linebacker uh, football player, just very thick neck um, and a big head. They get about three and a half feet at most, although I swear I've seen some that are bigger. Um, and weigh up to about 400 pounds. Um, we did have one adult a loggerhead come into our rehab facility two years ago who was every bit of 330 pounds. Um, and she was a lot. She was wonderful, but she was a lot. <laughs> they're big animals and they're very, very strong in the water. Um, these guys have very strong jaws um, and they are found all over the world, um, even a little bit farther north than, um, than the greens sometimes. Next is personal favorite of mine, as you can see behind me, uh, hawksbill sea turtle. A uh, very distinctive beak on these guys is where they get their name. So it definitely looks like a little bit of a parrot or a hawk uh, shaped bill. Um, similar coloration to the green sea turtles, but that face is always a dead giveaway. Um, and also this turtle is the only one that will retain this jagged edging on the back of its shell. Um, into maturity, into adulthood. Almost all sea turtles will have this when they're, um, when they're young, um, up to about like five years old or so, but eventually it will smooth down and be a rounded edge. These guys will keep this really jagged edge their entire life. A little bit smaller range, um, mostly temperate and tropical. They don't do a whole lot of migration. If they end up up here, it's usually by accident. And then the Kemp's Ridley, which is the one, like I said, I have had the most experience with. Um, they are the smallest and the most endangered sea turtle of the seven species that are out there. Um, they're a little bit of a mystery uh, up until the 1960s. Nobody really knew too much about them. Um, it was thought that they were actually a hybrid species because no one had seen them nest, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, we have researched them pretty extensively. We think they live to about 50 years old. Um, they are primarily carnivores. Their distribution is the smallest of any of the species. Um, it's kind of, this map is a little bit small, but you can see they spend most of their time um, on the east coast of the Americas, uh, primarily in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, their coloration is very muted compared to other sea turtles. Um, when they're young, they have this very dark coloration on the top of their body and very light underneath, that counter shading, very similar to dolphins. Um, so if an animal were underneath them, they would just see their white belly up against the sky. And if they were to look down, they'd see that dark carapace um, uh, as they look down towards the uh, darkness of the ocean. As they get older, a little bit lighter in coloration on top, but still very muted, not a super bright pattern like the greens or the hawksbill sea turtles. But their face does resemble a hawksbill, um, so they often can be confused with, uh, with them as well. Um, oh, they're named after um, Richard Moore Kemp. Uh, who was the first man to have um, delivered a species, a specimen of the sea turtle to uh, Harvard in the late 1800s. Um, the Ridley is still a little bit of a mystery, but I will talk about that later. Um, so more about the Ridleys. They primarily live in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this is where the juveniles and the adults all mostly hang out. They found all different um, age classes of them in this area. Um, so I live up in New England. Why do I work with the Kemp's Ridley so much? Well, when they're little, 
the thought is still not quite clear how they get up here, but the thought is that there is a, um, most of the time they spend their time in this little gyre in the um, Gulf of Mexico. But when they're small, some of them wander off a little bit. And so there's this current that kind of comes up between Cuba and the Florida Keys that then meets up with the Gulf Stream current. And the Gulf Stream current comes all the way up the east coast of uh, Florida and all the way up to um, New England. So they'll ride that current all the way up and then it kind of eddies around up here in the Gulf of Maine before it kicks off over towards um, England and Europe. But once they get up here to the Gulf of Maine, it's one of the biggest, the most um, fruitful feeding grounds um, in the area. So it has tons of crab, tons of fish, lots of things that they can feed on. So when they get stuck in that current and they end up up here in the summertime, they're like, oh, cool, be food. So they hang out for a little bit. Instinctively, as the water temps start to drop, they're being told, hey, we should head south because water's getting cold. We need to get back to warmer waters where we won't be in any trouble because turtles are cold-blooded. So they get all of their, um, their thermal regulation from their environment. Um, as the water temp drops, their body temperature cannot keep up. So their body temperature will also drop. So they instinctively will head south for survival. I don't know if you're familiar with the, uh, the uh, geography of uh, Massachusetts, but we have this unfortunate little cape that sticks out into the middle of the ocean. So as the sea turtles are following this shoreline all the way down to try to head south, and then they run into Cape Cod. And they're like, all right, cool. Instincts are telling me I should head east to get around whatever this is. And they head east, they head into the cape again. Their instincts never tell them to go north. To go south. That is not even a computation in their brains. So all they do is kind of hang out and ping pong around in this area until the water gets too cold for them to actually survive um, in any way. And they sort of, their bodies just start to shut down. They go completely hypothermic. They float to the surface of the water and then the winds will blow them um, into the beaches. So starting around Halloween, late October, um, the Mass Audubon Foundation um, will organize an army of volunteers to start walking the beaches um, in Cape Cod uh, about an hour or two after each high tide. So sometimes they're walking at three o'clock in the morning um, to get these turtles up off the beaches. And they choose the beaches based on the wind direction um, and the wind speed. And they'll go down there and um, pluck them out, out of the seabeds, the seagrass um, or seaweed or out of the, um, just off the beach itself. Really important to get them off the beach as soon as possible because while the water temp may still be in the 50s or so, the air temp in November in New England is not in the 50s. <laughs> it could be in the 30s. And that could give them frostbite or um, as you can see in this picture here, this turtle has some pretty severe frostbite um, on its shell. So really important that they get off the beach as soon as possible. Uh, then they are put in these banana boxes. Um, all of the um, grocery stores uh, up and down the Cape know to save their banana boxes and send them to Mass Audubon so that they can transport turtles in them. And then they are sent uh, to a warehouse in Quincy, Massachusetts, which is where I volunteer and occasionally work. Um, and this big old shipbuilding warehouse is filled with hundreds of thousands of gallons of seawater in many, many different tanks. Um, and these sea turtles are warmed up slowly to give their bodies a little bit of a chance to, um, to recover. They're treated with antibiotics. Um, sometimes they're surgically uh, treated as well, depending on if they have any kind of um, uh, injuries. Uh, often when they're floating up at the surface, especially early in the fall, um, there's still boat traffic and we have quite a few crop injuries that come in, a lot of frostbite. Um, but these guys look, you know, you can see these, they're very unhealthy. They're covered in algae um, and often like a lot of algae. <laughs> Uh, sometimes they need a little assistance to, uh, to breathe when they come in at first. Um, this picture was taken in, I think, 2014 when we had one of our biggest seasons. So normally we don't have this many turtles in a tank at one time, but sometimes, sometimes we just have to crowd them out a little bit until we can transport them and get them released. Once they're healthy enough, um, you've probably seen this picture, <laughs> we will transport them down south. Um, so we try to get them out as soon as possible. Um, to areas that are warm enough to release them. So obviously we can't release them up in New England until the summertime. So we'll do um, ground transportations and um, actually some air transportation as well. 
down to Florida, um, the Carolinas, depending on where the closest warmest water will be. Um, there's actually an army of volunteers, uh, volunteer pilots that has assembled that are now called Turtles Fly To, and they uh, will use just their own time and their own fuel and come and pick up our turtles and fly them down to Florida and the Carolinas um, basically as needed, which is pretty amazing uh, to have. So see how different these turtles look now. Um, they're very, very healthy. Um, and then they get released back out into the water. This was down in uh, Georgia in, I think, 2014, 2015. Um, some of the turtles, if they're big enough, we'll put satellite tags on them. You can see here, um, the satellite tag is fitted on that turtle. Um, so we can get more data on where they go after we release them. Do they go back to the old feeding grounds? Do they come back up north again? We have had a couple of repeat offenders that have come into the aquarium uh, twice. <laughs> no three timers yet, but we've had one or two that have come in uh, again to the rehab facility and we then send them back out again and hope that they learn their lesson this time. Um, that's a little bit about the rehab facility and what we do. Um, we currently this year has been our biggest year ever. Um, I don't know what the number is quite yet because we haven't had time to breathe and count, uh, but somewhere in the vicinity of 800 turtles uh, came through our doors. Um, highest previous to that was 733, and previous to that was 242. Um, my first season in 2011, we had 35. <laughs> so the Gulf of Maine is the warmest, the fastest body of water that is warming based on um, climate change. We think that has a lot to do with um, what's going on and why, they're, why their numbers are increasing so much um, for our rehab facility. Uh, so that's one accidental migration that can happen with that particular species of sea turtle. Um, and oftentimes they're, um, they're migrating because they have uh, nesting grounds they need to get to. So usually annually or biannually, um, they're, they will migrate to these different nesting um, beaches. They will always go back to the same beach that they were born on. Um, not much is known about how exactly they do that. Um, I think it has something to do with some sort of magnetic reading that they can do, um, maybe based on their use of the pineal gland, but it's definitely got something to do with um, the magnetism of the earth because it's, it's longitudinally, uh, they can, or la latitudinally, they can tell what beach or what part of the beach they need to go back to. So they have um, that um, beach fidelity for going back to the same place they were born. They figure, hey, if I was born here, something worked, I may as well lay my eggs here and maybe maybe my next generation will have a chance. Um, the floor, in Florida, there are, I think, four, maybe even five species of sea turtle that will nest on certain beaches. And you can actually tell the difference between the species based on the crawl track. So this crawl track here, um, these alternating apostrophes are very indicative of a loggerhead sea turtle. So you can see here, um, this alternating apostrophe track here. Then the greens and the leatherbacks are very similar. Um, they look like giant tire treads, but because the leatherback is so much bigger than a green sea turtle, by the width of the track, you could tell whether it's a green or a, a leatherback um, sea turtle crawl. How they decide what beaches or how they decide where to nest, um, they will wait, most, most sea turtles will wait until nightfall and they will head for uh, tall, dark silhouettes, whether that is vegetation or dunes or just low brush or even tall buildings. Uh, they don't necessarily head for the light of the moon or head away from the light of the moon because they will nest on moonless nights, uh, full moon nights. It's just basically they look up towards the sky and look for dark silhouettes, which is not what they're going to see over the ocean typically. Then once they find their area up above the high tide line, they will start to dig a a wide shallow hole with their front flippers um, and then they'll move up and they will start to dig a narrow deep hole with their rear flippers. While they're digging this hole and laying their eggs, they go into a little bit of a trance. Um, they're completely unresponsive to external stimuli for a little bit and this is a great opportunity for researchers to get data on turtles. So they'll often do measurements, um, they will scan the turtles to see if they've been tagged before um, and find out how long they've take to, to lay their nest, if they do any false crawls or false nest making. Um, once they do dig that hole, they will lay their eggs um, in the hole. Those eggs do have a bit of a drop um, to make into that deep hole. So the shells are very flexible at this point in time. So they bounce a little bit. 
Um, then once all the eggs are laid, uh, she will cover the nest uh, back with her, with her rear flippers, uh, pack it down, and then she'll toss sand around um, with her front flippers to kind of disguise the area where she nested so that it might confuse predators as to where exactly the nest is. And then she'll head away from those dark silhouettes and back to the sea. Um, see if this video will play. It's just a, I wanted you to get a sense of um, exactly how much dexterity they have with their back flippers. Um, there it is. Okay. Um, and how they can scoop that sand out. So it's this is a great video all the way through, but this particular part of it, you can see it on seaturtles.org. Um, but she's dug that big hole with her front flippers and then she's reaching down. This is a leatherback, reaching down with her flippers to grab that sand. The next part of the video is just, it's pretty incredible to see the way they can use those flippers like a hand to just scoop that sand out of the hole before they lay the eggs. We don't have enough time for the whole video, but I would highly recommend you take a minute to watch that if you have some spare time. There we go. Once the baby is, once the incubation has happened, um, and that can be anywhere between 45 and 80 days, depending on the species and the environment. So if it's a really warm beach, like down in the Caribbean, it'll take less time to incubate. If it's a colder beach, like the random one that was found in New Jersey a couple years ago, it'll take much longer, <laughs> a little bit cooler. But once the incubation period has happened, the eggs will be a little bit more brittle because what's happened is the uh, hatchlings have absorbed some of the calcium from the shell itself to create their own shell on, on their back. So now the shell is a bit more brittle and they have this little um, egg tooth on the very tip of their nose and that they can use to punch a hole through that now weakened shell. Once they're out of their egg, they don't leave the nest quite yet. They still have a yolk sac attached to their body that is basically their first meal because um, they have quite a big journey ahead of them. Um, so they'll absorb that yolk sac um, to get some energy for that big swim. They'll, once they feel the sand around them start to cool down, um, that will cue them to start to emerge from the nest, so under cover of darkness, which is a little bit more protection for them. And then they will head away from those tall dark silhouettes and back to the sea. Then they swim for about 24 to 36 hours until they reach the middle of, um, in this area or in the Caribbean area, like the middle of the Sargasso Sea, they find some uh, flotsam, some jetsam, some seaweed to tuck up under for protection and for food. Um, and they hang out there until they're big enough to move on to a reef system where they can start to feed and protect themselves there. And here are some pictures of some baby sea turtles. Um, if you thought it was hard to tell the different species when they're older, um, the babies are not easy at all. The only one I, the only two I can ever pick out is the green sea turtle, um, always has this white edging along the flippers and the shell. And then the leatherback just looks like a baby leatherback. They're pretty easy. The rest of these guys, you gotta count scoots and yeah, it's, it's a lot, but these are, I just figured you have to include some pictures of baby sea turtles because they're so stinking cute. So that's one migration that happens um, for nesting. The other reason turtles would migrate is mostly for food. Um, hatchlings, their first migration is to offshore um, uh, shelters, and then juveniles will go and migrate to some richer feeding grounds. Um, adults will do seasonal migration between feeding and mating grounds. Um, but most of the migrations after they've hatched, uh, unless they're nesting related, are for food. They just kind of follow their food around. Um, except for the green sea turtles, um, they, they do migrate a little bit, but mostly their, their food mostly stays still. Um, this video I hopefully will play. It's a video I took in uh, St. Croix last year. Is it fine? No, maybe not. Um, but sea turtles, the green sea turtles will feed primarily on their um, on sea, bed, sea grass beds. Um, so they just sort of come through and, uh, oh, oh, I thought it was going to play. Oh, okay. um, they will just feed on these seagrass beds um, and eat whatever other animals kind of come through that they can get their, their jaws on. Oh, there it is. And what they do is they just graze. They don't necessarily take out an entire grass bed. Uh, to sort of take off the tender ends of the grass and they will um, it actually helps 
the grass to uh, come back even quicker by the turtles feeding on them. All right, I think I have enough time to tell a quick story about another story about chemistry of the turtles. Um, they're absolutely fascinating turtles. Um, I love everything that I've learned about them so far. Um, so the Ridley part of the name, um, we think comes from them being such a riddle to, um, to scientists for so long. So they were definitely a mystery, mysterious turtle up until about the 1960s. Uh, scientists thought that they were just a hybrid of a couple different species of turtle uh, because they could not find where they nested. Most of this, what we knew back then about sea turtles was from where they nested, all up and down Florida and parts of uh, the southern east coast of the um, United States. We could tell, you know, oh, this is loggerheads, these are um, leatherbacks, uh, hawksbills, these, all these nests that would happen in, in Florida in particular. But we never found a nest for a Kemp's Ridley sea turtle. So, well, maybe it's just, maybe they're just hybrids. However, they were seeing thousands of them in the Gulf of Mexico. So that doesn't really explain it being a hybrid if there's so many of them. Um, so then one nest was seen um, on Padre Island in Texas in 1951. Okay, so maybe it's not a hybrid, maybe they do nest, but where are these other turtles coming from? Mystery was kind of solved in 19... 61, I believe it was, when a um, doctor from Corpus Christi saw a home video that was taken in 1947 um, by a pilot who was flying over a beach in Mexico and saw what now we understand to be called an arribata, which is a mass nesting event that the Kemp's Ridley sea turtles do. Um, arribata in uh, Spanish means arrival by sea. And what happened was it was this cloudy, windy, stormy day. And he looked down and saw this beach dotted with hundreds of thousands of sea turtles. And they'd all come up to nest in mass together, these Kemp's Ridley sea turtles. So he took this video and then nobody saw it until 15, or nobody in the biological community saw it um, until 15 years later. So in the video, you can also see people taking the eggs um, at the same time. I'm not going to show the video, but if you want to Google it, um, it is a really incredible video to see. It's just really not great quality to show over Zoom, um, but I would recommend looking it up. Um, if you just look up um, Kemp's Ridley 1947, um, it'll pop up. Um, so that was found in Rancho Nuevo, Mexico. Um, and in the 1960s, we were already starting to see habitat destruction um, and nest destruction as well. 90% um, of the nests that were laid in that area when they went down to Rancho Nuevo to investigate, um, they noticed that the nests were just being destroyed by harvesters, predators, no one was protecting the beach at all. So in 1966, um, the Mexican government was finally convinced to protect this beach um, and they literally brought in the military to do it. Um, they came down, the poachers were, were shooed off by armed guards. Um, and at that point in 1966, there were only 1,300 nests um, down from the estimated 40,000 that were uh, seen in that video of the flyover from 1947. Um, and the decline just kept, kept happening. Um, by 1985, there are only 702 nests total on this beach in Mexico, um, and only a handful found in Texas. And so scientists started wondering, what can we do to save, like, literally save this beach? So one of the, somebody mentioned, well, what about Padre Island? We found a nest there once. The biggest concern was that if this is the only beach that um, Rancho Nuevo place in Mexico, that's the only beach where these sea turtles nest, what happens if that beach gets destroyed by a storm or something happens, that whole species could get wiped out so easily. So what if we establish a secondary nesting site? Padre Island National Seashore, like I said, had um, a handful of um, nests that had been found there, and it seemed like a pretty good area. So what they decided to do um, is to move some of the nests from Mexico to this spot in Texas. And at the time, they didn't really understand how the turtles decided nest fidelity. Was it, um, they didn't know that it was something to do with the magnetism of the earth. They thought maybe it was something in the sand. So they literally waited for those turtles to, to dig their nests, and then they almost took a core sample, like took all the surrounding sand around that nest, put them in buckets, and then brought them to um, Potter Island National Seashore in Texas. This area was already protected, so it didn't have to do any changes there. They waited for the nest to hatch. 
and then they let them crawl out to the ocean because again they didn't know when and how they imprinted on that beach so they wanted to make sure they imprinted as best they could they waited for them to hatch and crawl out to the sea and just before they got to the ocean they scooped them up what they wanted to do was give those turtles a, what's called a head start so they brought them into a facility and raised them in that facility for 11 months um, to get them big enough so that they wouldn't be as easily predated on and then they could release them out into the wild after they um, had grown a little bit bigger. Before they released them, they gave them what are called living tags, which meant that they took a piece of their plastron, the lower part of their shell, and transplanted it to the upper part of their shell. So it ended up being like a biological tag instead of a metal tag or something that could eventually cause them harm as they grew. Um, thinking that that white spot would grow along with them and that would make them easily identifiable if they were to ever come back to that beach. Now it takes sea turtles 15 to 20 years to actually get sexually mature to return to a nesting beach. So then they had to wait to see if their experiment worked. First, the, the first live tagged turtle, as you can see here, there's that, that tag there, uh, was reported in 1996. There were two, <laughs> yay. 1997, there were zero, and then 98, there were 13. 1999, there were 16, and the numbers kept increasing. So what they did was working. Not only that, but because they had protected the original beach um, with the armed guards and turned into a national seashore as well, everything started to turn around for this, this sea turtle. In 2009 was the initial peak of the nesting, um, which they had 20,000 nests that were counted. Um, that includes Texas as well as um, the original nesting site in Mexico. And that was including 200 sea turtles at uh, Padre Island uh, National Seashore in Texas. So that's quite a, quite a bit of a jump. Um, there was a little bit of a fall off in 2010. And if you remember, if anybody remembers what happened in 2010 with the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, that makes sense. But since then it has continued to increase. They are still monitoring. And um, this is a very happy graph. Um, this top graph is the number of nests in Texas. Um, and it's broken down into um, ones that have been live imprints or that were the head started turtles um, and then wild stock as well. So up to 210 nests um, in 2013. And the latest number I could find was 2017. They had 353 at that site in Texas. Um, and then the bottom graph is the number of sea turtles in Mexico, which has jumped to uh, almost 22,000 nests. Um, and 24,000 was the latest number in 2017. They haven't done the numbers for 2020 yet, but conservation works. That's the key to that, um, those slides and the story of the Kemp's Ridley uh, species that we almost lost. Um, other species of sea turtles have lots of threats that they have to worry about. Um, the nests, it, it's through their entire life cycle. So the nests have to, um, if the turtle can't get up above the high tide line, um, they could be inundated by either water or, uh, or plant life or fungi, fungi. And you can see in this picture here, this is a sea turtle crawl that's going along a seawall um, somewhere down south that a restaurant or a hotel was built um, so that there is no, no sand above the high tide line. Um, so this turtle had to then go back into the ocean and try to find another beach to lay her eggs on. Um, habitat destruction is a huge problem with nesting. Uh, predators, humans, um, there's still uh, poachers that happen in certain parts of the world as well. And then once they're hatchlings, they are just, they're snacks for predators. They, there's some statistic like 2% of uh, nests will actually survive to adulthood. Um, they have to worry about ingesting marine debris, little small little plastics, um, and also getting stuck in some of the finer mesh nets. The adults worry about boat strikes. Um, there's marine debris, not only ingestion at this point, but also entanglement in ghost nets or fishing line. Um, there's habitat destruction and their own foods habitat destruction as well as diseases. Um, and in certain parts of the world, turtles are still hunted. Um, it is becoming less and less popular, thankfully, um, but they have historically and are still hunted for their meat, their oil, um, for the leatherbacks, um, and their shell for jewelry as well. All sea turtles are considered um, some level of threatened. Um, this, is, uh, this is still accurate. The critically endangered is the Kemp's Ridley and the Hawksbill. Um, endangered, the loggerhead in green are still on the, I think the global endangered list, but locally, um, I believe the greens and possibly even the loggerheads um, have been delisted in Florida, which is great news. Um, again, conservation works. 
Um, and then vulnerable and threatened are the leatherback, the flatback, and the olive ridges that are um, in different parts of the world. Um, conservation efforts that have been working, the Endangered Species Act um, is always a, a good one to cite, as well as CITES, which is the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species. Um, that's the group that's in charge of deciding what animals should stay on, come off, um, or move down the endangered species list globally. Um, problem with any of this, though, is there's no, there's no global police, no one to enforce any of this on a international level. Um, so it really comes down to local regulations um, and local enforcement. Um, one of the big success stories has been uh, in Florida, where home construction has um, kind of made new home construction move away from the ocean. Um, and Florida has been really good about nesting beaches, um, keeping uh, lights off in certain areas during nesting season. Um, there's been a lot of efforts in fishing as well um, for avoiding bycatch of sea turtles. There are um, turtle exclusion devices on dredges um, and nets that basically kick sea turtles out of any sort of dredge nets. Um, and a lot of the uh, dredgers do have observers on them from um, the fish and wildlife areas that will, um, if any turtle does come up in a dredge, um, they will make note of what species it is, what species it is, if it is harmed, if it can be released, if it needs to go to rehab. Um, and that is to not only help the turtle species, but also help the dredging companies to figure out more efficient ways to, to not affect the turtles while they do their job. Um, it's really hard to track the successes in these conservation efforts with sea turtles because they do, uh, they do mature so late in life. So often we have to wait 15 to 20 years to see if what the conservation efforts um, are, what are working. Uh, but so far, this seems positive. <laughs> Something that you can do to help uh, personally, um, participate in coastal cleanups if you are able to, if you live near a beach or a marine or even next to a stream, cleaning up um, any sort of plastics or litter that can um, make its way down to the ocean. Um, if you have a boat or you are ever on a boat and you're fishing, making sure say, all your fishing gear stays out of the water unless you're actively using it to fish with. If you do hook a sea turtle, um, it's don't, don't be ashamed, don't be embarrassed, it happens. Um, but there are definitely phone numbers to call to report that. Um, even if the turtle is unharmed, oftentimes the, um, the marine authorities will wanna know like what species was it, how big was it, um, where were you, just so that they can um, have that information for if something happens to the turtle later on or just for general data purposes. Um, if you live near a beach or you're vacationing near a beach, trying to keep uh, any beaches in the tropic areas um, nest safe, so if you're building sandcastles or burying something in the sand, make sure you fill that hole in afterwards. Um, removing any beach equipment at night specifically and keeping the beaches dark during nesting, need, nesting season. Um, and always volunteering, uh, supporting local, local organizations that, um, that are supporting any sort of marine resource um, efforts as well. I like to try to do one small thing every day to help everything out in the ocean there. Um, reduce, reuse, recycle is the moniker that we all, we all remember, but the reduce part is really important, trying to reduce the amount of stuff that we, we use and then reusing and recycling what we can. Um, trying to eat responsibly, um, not only fish, but also other um, meats, vegetables, et cetera. You can use the Seafood Watch app to um, find fish that is harvested sustainably um, in a way that doesn't affect the marine environment as much as others might. Um, sunscreens are a big one. Uh, sunscreens can harm coral reefs, um, which are areas that sea turtles use for shelter and for feeding. So trying to use mineral-based sunscreens that, um, that don't have any uh, bad effects on yourself or the reefs. Um, and doing one, one thing every day to try to reduce your carbon footprint, whether that's just unplugging your devices when you're not using them, walking to the store instead of driving, um, just all little things that, that everybody can do to help protect not only sea turtles, but dolphins and marine life in general. Um, that's it for me. I will unshare my screen so that if there were any questions. Thank you so <laughs> much. There are indeed questions. Okay. Let me see. Oh, I'm going to kick you off. I'm just going to remind folks um, where they can find other recorded DCP webinars. Um, so if you want to find them directly on our website, dolphincommunicationproject.org, just check out that education menu and you'll find webinars listed. Each webinar is also on our YouTube channel, finally cleverly named Dolphin Communication Project.
Act. So you can find all of those there. Um, you can also listen to our podcast for free, um, The Dolphin Pod, and, and our hosts have a, a good comedic spin on uh, marine science now. So definitely check that out again directly on our website or wherever you get your podcasts. Our next um, deep dive webinar, which is what this was, so geared towards an older audience, but you don't have to have a science background. Um, they are generally the second and fourth Thursdays each month. Um, so our next one is the 25th of February. So be on the lookout for beluga contact behavior. That's coming soon. And then we also have dolphin lessons, which are geared towards a younger audience, but we think everyone enjoys them. Um, and those are generally the first and third Tuesdays. So our next one is this coming third Tuesday. Um, so be on the lookout for dolphin adaptations coming next. And those are both at one o'clock Eastern time um, if you want to listen live. And then we absolutely encourage you to support sea turtle research and rehab and conservation organizations. And if you want to support DCP, um, we have lots of ways to that you can do it. Um, you can adopt a dolphin, you can become a member, make a donation, you can get sporty t-shirts. Here's one there. Um, you can join us in the field as soon as that is safe to do so. Um, we're hoping to get people back to our study site in Honduras and in Bimini. Our Bimini Eco Tour is in July, 2021. So if you're listening before that and you want to join, reach out and we'll let you know if we are um, able to do it safely and if there's spaces available. Available. Um, and a reminder of our website, our email address, social media. So please do stay in touch. Um, and with that, Kat, we will um, toss a few questions your way. Um, now I can't um, see my, anyway, I will leave that up. I remember my questions because now I can't find them on my screen because um, I'm so tech savvy. Um, but one of the first questions we got was about those impressive tortoises and their ages. How does one age a tortoise? How, how do we know that they're that old? So from what I read about those guys is that they actually, the, the one in India um, had caretakers that was, they passed on, like they knew when that one hatched. And the caretakers, you know, nobody lived, one person lives for 250 years. The caretakers passed on the information um, as as they went through the generations, so that's that's how they know with that turtle anyway. Um, and this is only known for the the captive ones, of course. So you can't really age a wild sea turtle um, like you can, uh, you know, with fish. You can age them by their ear bones, um, or in with size, sort of by sizes. Because um, one interesting thing about reptiles is they never stop growing. Um, they do slow down, um, but they don't ever stop growing. Um, but you can't really tell like growth rings or anything like that with a turtle. It's just the only way you'd know is if someone, hey, I remember that one. That one, that one was born <laughs> or they're captive. Um, along those lines, when you showed us the tracks on the beach, which I'm going to have to get that chart for um, this coming spring and summer in Bimini so that we know um, what we're looking at. Um, can you use the tracks to then estimate the size of that female? I would say yeah, um, because basically their their back flippers aren't going to extend much beyond a couple inches. So if you can tell where the back, which ones, the back flippers are going to kind of dig in a little bit more, and the front flippers will be a little bit more like wide and shallow. So if you can tell the back flippers where they end, you can get an estimate of the width, and that can kind of give you an idea of ratio wise what the length would be based on. Because we have a lot of data on on that, um, like how all the turtles that we bring in the house, we measure their width and their length, so we have a ton of information on that. So yeah, I would say you could. Cool. Um, and here in Bimini, of course, I'm thinking about all the, the turtles we see when we're out on the boat. Cat joins us out on the boat sometimes. Um, when I see that little head with that pointy face take a breath, I'm like, oh, it's a hawk's bill. Oh, it's a hawk's bill. Is it possible in Bimini that we're seeing a Kemp's Ridley sometimes, or is that unlikely? It's fairly unlikely. Um, most of them are going to be on the Gulf Coast of Florida. I think I just randomly read about one nesting in like around Vero area, mm -hmm. maybe like the 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 what's it called the Space Coast. 
um, but that's a rarity. Most of the time they're going to be on the west coast of Florida, east coast of, of Mexico in that area. Um, so I would say probably not, but their heads are very, very similar. Um, I would look for that kind of the, the dark if they're the same in the same size of the hawksbill, they're going to have that really dark top of the head and not that mm. brown kind of mottledness that the hawksbills have. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and for nesting, I'm bouncing all around with these questions, but um, you mentioned that the it's they don't have to have a full moon to nest, but they'll also be looking for those dark silhouettes and to keep the beach lines um, dark during nesting season. Can you explain that a little more? And in part, I've also heard that if it can't be dark, it should be certain colored lights versus another colored lights. What's fact, what's fiction? What's the best thing to do? So I have heard the light thing. Um, I know certain islands in the Caribbean have changed all their, their street lights to red. And I think that that doesn't quite, the light doesn't quite register the same way as like a bright white light would um, with turtles. Um, that That is a bit above my pay grade in terms of how sea turtle eyes work. Um, <laughs> but um, in terms of the silhouettes, so next time you go out at night, like the sky is always going to be a little bit lighter, whether there's a moon or no moon, than the horizon. Um, so what they're seeing is just that the glow of the sky, whether there's a moon in it or whether it's light pollution or whatever, um, against the background of the sand dunes, the, the trees, the buildings. Um, if the buildings are all lit up, the houses are all lit up, and then you aren't going to see that silhouette. You're going to see a light, and the turtle's going to be like, Wait, what? And try to crawl away from that light or just get confused and go back to the ocean and try to find a different area to, to nest. So. That, does that make a little more sense? Yeah, thank you. Um, and then in terms of kind of when humans intervene versus when we let nature take its course, um, here I was a part of a frenzied team um, as the rep for the Bahamas Marine Mammal Stranding Network. And we did intervene with a nest that was being washed away. Um, and part of the rationale for not just letting nature take its course was that humans had altered that beach. So we had reason to believe the female couldn't get above the high tide line. So it sort of felt like eh, it's humans fault. This nest is washing yeah. away. We should do what we can. Um, the loggerhead example that you gave in the Cape in the marsh where she needed help reorienting and getting back out to sea. How did your team, um, the team decide that that turtle needed help? So this area in, in Wellfleet, um, it's super tidal. Like the tides are not at all like down in Bimini in Florida. Like our tides exchange is in some areas, like in that area, I think it's something like eight or 10 feet. It's, it's ridiculous. Like boats are on the, on, boats are on, on dry <laughs> in the harbor. Um, so she was up in, in the dry and mm. it's for a turtle that size, it can be really detrimental for them to be hard on their on their shell for that long. Like they need to breathe, and in order for them to breathe, their plastrons are flexible so that they can expand their chest. The, the hard shell on top is not. So if they can't breathe in order to lift their heavy bodies, um, that can be really detrimental. So we were trying to figure out like, okay, and this was the, the tide had gone out, but wasn't all the way out and hadn't started coming back in yet. So we were like, how, how can we help this turtle? This turtle is stuck in, and she was deep in a harbor too, um, where she may not have been able to navigate to back, get back out. So we went down to respond. We went out onto a boat to go to this marsh um, to try to see what we could do. Um, and then when we got there, we realized there really wasn't much we could do other than, okay, take an opportunity to maybe get a blood draw. She seemed very healthy. The first concern was, is this turtle sick? Like, is she disoriented or is she sick? Um, so we did some blood draws, um, and after us, a few of us getting knocked over by her flippers, we realized she was not sick. She She's was fine. She strong. was just lost. <laughs> and so at this point, we're like, well, can we make her more comfortable when the tide comes in? Can she get out of here? She was facing the wrong way, obviously getting agitated by us being there. Um, there was no way to get a boat into where she was or a truck, so that was where the tide started to come in, and we're like, all right, our best bet is just going to be to turn her because at the point she was facing kind of more in towards the harbor. We just wanted to try to rotate her as the tide came in, floated her, rotated her and just started pushing <laughs> to get her out. And she wasn't seen again. So we have to assume 
that we did the right thing. But, it was uh, a one-time offense, yeah, as you say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the most, like, what turtles are not supposed to be, like, that type of sea turtle is not supposed to be in a harbor. She's pelagic. She's supposed to be out and about. She doesn't nest up here. There's no reason for her to be there. So that was mm -hmm. sort of the main, first main concern of, like, what is she doing in there? Once we realized she was just a little disoriented, we're like, all right, we just need to get her out. Get her out. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we might have time for one more question, um, which I'll scoop up unless Kathleen has one she's been dying to ask. Um, that while we're with the leatherback and their soft shell, relatively speaking, um, are they more vulnerable? I mean, they're massive, so maybe when they're smaller, vulnerable to predation from above as well. I always think of the hard shell of a sea turtle as protecting it. But then if there's this massive and successful species that actually doesn't have a hard shell, what's what's their trick? Yeah, well, okay, it's not to say that that skin isn't also very hard. Um, mm. <laughs> that skin is super thick um, and it is those ridges are very bony. And if you see those ridges p do protrude out past the skin. So that acts as a little bit of a protectant. Um, and unfortunately, fortunately, I've been able to participate in three leatherback necropsies. And I will say that it's not easy getting through that the top of that shell, even though it's considered a soft uh, leatherback skin. It's it's still very hard and much acts as a very protective coating. Um, and then underneath that skin isn't just immediately organs. There's a really thick layer of this super sticky vic this blubber, and then fat, and then organs. So yeah, she can get, you know prop strike is not going to be great for him or her, um, but it's not going to be immediately deadly it's not ideal but she they can survive quite a bit yeah. um, most of the ones we've seen with massive injuries that they weren't able to survive are actually to their their flippers um, so the flippers are probably the most vulnerable part of those turtles so uh, the soft shell is, is not necessarily as honest as now <laughs> but well, i would imagine too if they've been around in their current form for millions Hundreds and of millions of years <laughs> yeah there's a good design there. It's working. Yeah, it works. Yeah, they're very fast too, so they can yeah. like scoot out of the way. Get away. Awesome. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for all of that information. We love being able to get people um, inspiring and accurate information that isn't only about dolphins, um, because believe it or not, <laughs> DCP actually loves the whole ocean and uh, wants to help inspire people to protect everything in the ocean. Um, so thank you so much, Kat, for uh, that awesome presentation. And thank you to everyone who thank has been me. listening um, whenever that is. And we hope to see you at another DCP webinar. Bye. Thanks so much. Have Thanks. a great rest of your day or afternoon. You too. Bye.